The real Muslims, they are against the alphabet mafia agenda in a very big way. So these women in this who are, you know, are saying, oh, this letter, oh, wow, it just, it just changed my worldview. You need, you need to go and watch it. Excuse me, you need to go and read it. They don't realize that this is a religion of oppression. This is a, a misogynistic, woman-hating religion. So again, this completely escaped them. And I'm sure that it escaped them that part of the reason why Osama bin Laden wanted to engineer attacks against the United States, you know what the Muslims often refer to the United States as? The great Satan, the great Satan. This morning I read Letter to America, which is Osama bin Laden's letter to America explaining why he attacked Americans. And I am ashamed to say that I not only have never read this letter, but I didn't even know this letter existed. It's wild and everyone should read it. If you haven't read it yet, read it. However, be forewarned that this has left me very disillusioned and I feel the same exact way I felt when I was deconstructing Christianity. I feel uh, a little bit just confused, like I have entered into another timeline. What is this? And yeah, so go read it. So I just read a letter to America and I will never look at life the same. I will never look at this country the same. I will never, I please read it and if you have read it let me know if you are also going through an existential crisis in this very moment because in the last 20 minutes my entire viewpoint on the entire life I have believed and I have lived has changed please read that entire letter I need everyone to stop what they're doing right now and go read it's literally two pages go read a letter to America and please come back here and just let me know what you think because I feel like I'm going through like an existential crisis right now and a lot of people are so I just need someone else to be feeling this too. I need you to stop what you're doing and go read A Letter to America. It is literally the craziest thing I've read in a while and while I can't say that I'm that surprised I am pretty shocked. So go read it and tell me what you think because I really also need to talk to other people about this. Those are Gen Zers responding to the letter to America written by the terrorist Osama bin Laden, the architect of the 9-11 attacks. Um, at last count, there were roughly 14 million clicks on hashtag letter to America on that social media platform. Now, what really is going on here that these Gen Zers are responding to this so strongly? This letter, which has been around for quite some time, some of you maybe have read it, others of you perhaps have not. I encourage you uh, to go and read it. Sometimes it's a little difficult because there is an effort to, um, to censor it. But it's only, as one of them says here, it's only just a couple of pages long. It's very straightforward, even in translation, and easy to read. Well, you have the first woman who says that reading it has, quote, left her disillusioned. The second woman says that it uh, has left her in, quote, an existential crisis, and that it only took 20 minutes, <laughs> just 20 minutes to change her outlook on life completely, it seems. And the third woman and then the, uh, the fourth person, who was a, who was a guy, I think, uh, simply parrot what the first two said. So what did Osama bin Laden say in this apparently highly persuasive letter to America that rocked the worlds of these Gen Zers and left them in disillusioned existential crises. Well, he says this. I'm not going to read the entire letter, but I am going to quote it fairly extensively for you because I want you, first of all, to understand what it is that Osama bin Laden has said in this letter. And if you find it to be you know, highly persuasive, I mean, gosh, I don't want it to rock your worlds. I don't want it to change your worldviews um, completely because you just simply can't process or handle what is in here. But I, I want you to understand what is in the letter. And then 
I want to discuss what's going on in the minds of, of Gen Zers, of these Gen Zers at least, that this would be so jarring to them. Or rather, I think it's uh, more appealing to them what Osama bin Laden had to say. Well, here are a few quotations from it. The first thing, he says, the first thing that we, Al-Qaeda, are calling you, that is America, to is Islam. The discarding of all opinions, orders, theories, and religions which contradict with the religion Allah sent down to his prophet Muhammad. So, first of all, this letter from Osama bin Laden, which is not particularly well written, it's a it's a rant, um, but it is Islamic from beginning to end. It is quite faithful to that religion from beginning to end. So he says, we're calling you, America, to Islam and to the discarding of opinions, all opinions, theories, religions, which contradict with that religion. So right away, Osama bin Laden is indicating in this letter that he is opposed to to free speech. He's opposed to freedom. He's opposed to freedom of religion. And this is very important to understand about Islam. Now, I think that escaped these Gen Zers. I think it just went straight over their head. They only processed the parts of his letter that appealed to them, that resonated with their predisposed um, you know, worldview, their a priori assumptions about life, the very things which they've been taught to believe, because this certainly would not fit with their notions of diversity and tolerance and uh, you know acceptance. That is that is not Islam. Islam is not about tolerance. It's definitely not about diversity, and it is not about acceptance. I some years ago did a debate on. I can't remember. I've done I've done several of these, but I I did a debate. I think it was on CNN International, based out of London with a Muslim, a Muslim convert. I was a little disappointed with the person that I was debating because, you know, CNN International is based in London and there are loads of radicals in London, uh, radical Muslims, which I really kind of hate to use that term because radical Islam is just orthodox Islam. It's just those people who really take seriously uh, the life of Muhammad, the Hadith and the Quran. But I thought, you know, um, CNN International, being in London, they would be able to get me a real Muslim to debate. And instead, I come on air and I find myself debating a hippie Muslim, former Baptist convert, a woman to Islam. And the thing that we were debating, the theme of this debate, which only lasted, I don't know, five minutes, seven minutes, something like that, a television, it's ex extremely quick. It's why I prefer radio. You have a little more flexibility, was free speech. And at some point, either either on air or that when the debate continued um, on social media, I, I can't I can't remember because it's been uh, it's been many years now. Um, I just simply asked the question. She was maintaining that Islam is about free speech, and uh, this was really really her American mindset that was coming through it in no way reflected, you know, real Islam. She had these quaint notions of Islam, which were in no way accurate. But I said, name for me an Islamic state that believes in free speech. Name one. Name one. And of course, she couldn't. And thus, the debate was over. And this is what Osama bin Laden is saying in this letter, the first thing we are calling you to is Islam. The discarding of all opinions, orders, theories, and religions which contradict the religion Allah sent down to his prophet Muhammad. So right away, we see that he is opposed to freedom of just about every kind. Now, again, I don't think these Gen Zers picked up on that. I think that just skated right by them. Then he says this, as any real Muslim would say this, not the, not the ones who are like Methodists, you know, who don't really take their holy, holy writings particularly seriously, but I mean the real hardcore Quran-believing Muslims. He says that it is the goal of Al-Qaeda to, quote, to make Sharia the supreme law and to regain Palestine to make Sharia the supreme law and to regain Palestine. So this 
Second part of this probably appealed to them because a lot of Gen Zers and some millennials are buying into the um, the rhetoric regarding the Israel Hamas war. They're buying into the Palestinian rhetoric. They're buying into the free Palestine rhetoric. They're buying into a lot of the anti-Semitic rhetoric. But I imagine the first part of this, the first clause, to make Sharia the supreme law, again, that was another element that went right over them. Uh, we sometimes say um, Sharia law, and that really is um, repetitious. Uh, Sharia means law, but it is Islamic law. It is the thing that leads to women wearing burqas and hijabs, and it is the thing that leads to everyone living a kind of cookie-cutter sort of life. It is the thing that leads to stonings. It is the thing that leads to um, human degradation, to uh, a bondage on the human spirit, as it is in every Islamic state you care to name. And then he continues, and I quote, You are a nation that permits acts of immorality, and you consider them to be pillars of personal freedom. You have continued to sink down this abyss from level to level until incest has spread among you, in the face of which neither your sense of honor nor your laws object. Now here we hit on a point where I think Christians and many social conservatives would say, ah, we by and large agree with him on this point. Yes, we now we would define these immoral acts probably a little bit differently because again, he would say anything that isn't consistent with Sharia is an immoral act. I would not agree with that. That said, um, what Osama bin Laden is talking about here is Muslims are, uh, again, the, um, the real Muslims, they are against the alphabet mafia agenda in a very big way. So these Gen Zers, I'm sure, again, this was something that went straight over their head that they did not pick up on in this. Uh, Islam is, you know, this, these, these women in this who are, you know, are saying, oh, this letter, oh, wow, it just, it just changed my worldview. You need, you need to go and watch it. Excuse me, you need to go and read it. They don't realize that this is a religion of oppression. This is a, a misogynistic, woman-hating religion religion. So again, this completely escaped them. And I'm sure that it escaped them that part of the reason why Osama bin Laden wanted to engineer attacks against the United States, you know what they Muslims often refer to the United States as? The great Satan. The great Satan. Do you know what their recruiting posters and recruiting lines consist of? They point to the United States and they say, Look at this. Like, for instance, the transsexual agenda, which, which came after Osama bin Laden was, was uh, at least, you know, in its full, you know, um, uh, manifestation the way we're seeing now. I think he was killed in 2011. I think that's when he was hunted down and, um, and shot. But they would point to things like men saying they're women and women saying they're men. They would point to things like Leah Thomas. They would point to things like so-called Rachel Levine. They would point to Sam Brenton. And they would say, see, these are individuals that can't tell. This is a country, a civilization. They cannot tell the difference between men and women, much less between right and wrong, or even between man and animal. Join us. Help us destroy the great Satan. Everyone's going to encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering? Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do. And undoubtedly, some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. 
I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I want to tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. You are a nation that permits acts of mora- uh, immorality, which neither your sense of honor nor your laws uh, object to. And there's a lot of truth to that. We probably have to own that. But I don't think Gen Z is picking up on that. That's not the part of this letter that resonates with them. And, and there's no telling. I mean, one can only imagine what this letter would consist of if, um, if Osama bin Laden had written this letter you know, last week. Because uh, there's a lot more that he could certainly add to this in terms of America's uh, immorality. But then he goes on, he drones on about America killing innocent people, which certainly has happened. That is true. It, it has happened. America has killed uh, often many innocent people. But he drones on about this while ignoring the fact that he had just killed 3,000 innocent people. Americans in his 9-11 attacks. So on the one hand, he says, you know, you kill innocent people, and then he flew planes into the sides of buildings and doesn't seem, that, that in no way seems to factor into Osama bin Laden's logic here. So this is a Hitlerian kind of document that he has written here. So the question becomes, what is it that some Gen Zers find so compelling in this letter, well, we discuss ideas on this show. You know, as we say, ideas have consequences. And there are ideas that are being expressed in this letter that appeal to many Gen Zers. And I want to be very clear when I say this. I don't want to sound like the, um, who are those old guys, you know, in the Muppets? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I, I love them in um, a Muppet Christmas Carol, you know, sitting up in the uh, the balcony, and once the speech is given, they say it was horrible, it was terrible, it was short. I loved it. <laughs> uh, I don't want to sound like one of the one of the old Muppets who were saying, you know, they're, they're all young whippersnappers. You know, they just they just weren't the way we were when we were kids. I, I don't want to come off sounding like that. But. There are a number of Gen Zers who have found this letter very compelling. Uh, again, this is this. I don't think this is representative of all Gen Zers, but it is. It is representative of a significant minority. Again, at last count, at about the time we began airing this this particular episode or um, recording it, there are about 14 million views. Now, Kim Kardashian probably gets more than that for her breakfast, but. Regardless, that's a lot of people. And not all of them are people who, some of them be people like me or you who are perhaps clicking on that because they're interested in the topic and they're, they want to read you know, what's happening there. But as these videos indicate, there, there are a number of Gen Zers who are not properly processing this. So what is it? What is it in Osama bin Laden's letter that they find so jarring that should leave them with existential crises that should should shatter their view of the world in a mere 20 minutes well in addition to the america and jew hating theme that runs throughout osama bin laden's letter he says three things that hit the sweet spot with this generation the first is environmental it's actually quite surprising this part did jar me because i didn't expect it you know, when I, when I first read this, you would, you would not think Osama bin Laden would include anything about the environment. I'm not sure that he actually believed it. This may have been an effort to kind of, you know, kind of hook some Westerners with this. But he says this, you have destroyed nature with your industrial waste and gases more than any other nation in history. 
Despite this, you refuse to sign the Kyoto Agreement so that you can secure the profit of your greedy companies and industries. Osama bin Laden he is here trying to sound like he's a man of the people. You know, Osama bin Laden's net worth was uh, roughly about $50 million. This was a guy who had a lot of money. The, the initial narrative, for those of you who are old enough to remember, the initial narrative about 9-11 was that these were the oppressed. These were victims of American, the people who flew the planes into, the, into these buildings. These were, these were the world's oppressed. They, they had been oppressed by Western imperialism. They were the poor, the uneducated, and hence they were lashing out at, against the West and everything that they did not have. If only we threw money at the, at, at the problem and helped raise the standard of living in these people, these things wouldn't happen. And then it became very clear when they were identified who they were that they didn't, this, didn't, this didn't fit the narrative at all. They were educated. They had wealth. They had opportunity. They did not fall into the narrative that the left wanted to create for them. And here's Osama bin Laden who is saying, you know, you guys, you know, you, you, you steal from all over the world and it's your greenhouse gases are destroying the planet. Now that would resonate with millennials and Gen Zers a lot. And it's because they have been inundated with this. And they go, oh, wow, Osama bin Laden, he was, he was a man before his time. Osama bin Laden was a nature lover. Osama bin Laden was a, he was, he was the male Greta Thunberg. That's who he was. He just blew up some crap every now and then, but killed a few thousand people. But he loved nature. He loved the environment. He was a man of the people. And he's complaining that the United States had not at that time signed the Kyoto Agreement. That definitely would resonate with the kind of people who are in this video that we saw at the very beginning. The second thing that he says in this letter that, that really captures the, the minds of some Gen Zers is, did you catch, if you read it, you'll pick up on a theme of white supremacy. White supremacy. He says this. The freedom and democracy that you call to is for yourselves and for white race only. I'm reading, it should be white races or something, but the, the translation of these isn't always the smoothest. The freedom and democracy that you call to is for yourselves and for white race only. As for the rest of the world, you impose upon them your monstrous, destructive policies and governments. That, again, would resonate with millennials and Gen Zers. It's the white supremacist narrative. It is this idea, you know, remember Biden said the greatest threat to freedom in America, in the Western world, is white supremacy. Now, this is sheer nonsense. It is sheer nonsense. But here he is saying this. You guys only want freedom for white people. You don't want it for anybody else, just, just for white people. That would definitely resonate with them. Now, the second part here that he says, for the rest of the world, you impose upon them your monstrous, destructive policies and governments. I would agree with him on that point to a degree, but probably not in the way that he believes it. As somebody who travels so very extensively, and I've written this, I've published this in uh, in various articles, and I wrote it in my uh, in my last book, around the world in more than eighty days. America's influence around the world is Jekyll and Hyde. It is Jekyll and Hyde, and that is because it depends on the administration that we're talking about. For instance, if you look at a country like Japan, Japan is. America's great post-World War II success story, Japan still uses a constitution that was basically written by Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, and his staff. It's arguably the most democratic constitution in the world and one of the most enduring constitutions in the world. The uh, imposition of uh, democracy, of freedom, 
uh, of bringing Japan kicking and screaming to some extent into the modern world. Japan was an emperor-worshipping, fascist, a feudal, misogynistic a country through World War II. After World War II, that changed, and it is one of the most... Japan is an amazing country. Uh, having been there, I can tell you it is, a, it is an amazing country. Uh, there's a, you know, many problems, as with uh, the rest of the world, but it is a remarkable country, and that is largely due to American influence. So in that sense, America's influence is good Dr. Jekyll. But then there's the Mr. Hyde influence. And the Mr. Hyde influence has come in the form of democratic, uh, Democrat policies uh, from, say, Clint, the Clinton administrations uh, to the Obama administrations to now Biden. And those are chiefly pushing abortion, the alphabet mafia agenda, and, uh, and generally a complete disregard for what the people of any given country want. Um, we are seeing this um, in South America. We are seeing this in Africa. The, the, Africans, the Africans especially deeply, deeply resent uh, Clinton and Obama and the Biden administration is because they're soft on Islam and they are pushing the LGBTQ agenda and they're pushing abortion. These are generally fairly conservative cultures and do not like this. South America, still, you know, Catholicism is a major driver um, of worldview and policy in South America. And the, uh, the pushing of these perverse agendas is deeply offensive to these people. So in that sense, it's, it's Mr. Hyde. So I, I, I don't want to, um, to put on rose-colored glasses here and say that America is always the white knight, is always the good guy. We often are not. And by the way, what we are doing in Ukraine right now, we are definitely the bad guy. We're the bad guy. What, did, did Lindsey Graham really say that we will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian? <laughs> did, did he say that? I mean, it's a startling statement. Whether he said it or not, he clearly seems to believe it. You listen to Nikki Haley, she's ready to go and fight everybody. She's ready, she's ready to declare war all over the world, it would seem. What we are doing in Ukraine is corrupt, is deeply, deeply corrupt. We are not always the good guy. Now, Osama bin Laden, in, uh, in saying this, Again, these Gen Zers probably are all Democrats. Probably every one of them are, um, are Democrats. And so that's probably not the part of his letter that is really um, you know, capturing their attention. But it's a part of the letter that we could say, okay, well, there's a discussion to be had about that. Maybe, maybe it could have been a real discussion if you hadn't flown those planes into the sides of buildings and now we have to hunt you down and shoot you. But... Here it is in his letter. The freedom and democracy that you call for is for yourselves and for the white race. That's the part that um, really, really um, appeals to them. And then the third thing in his letter that I think Gen Zers and some millennials would find very appealing is the sense of mission. He's calling them to mission. To the naive and foolish, Bin Laden's letter feels like a a call to noble action, to save the earth, to save the earth environmentally um, from America's waste and from its, uh, you know, its pillaging of the, the global resources, to save the earth from America's awful, terrible influence. And, um, and again, this is a generation that has been taught to hate their country, which has given them everything. They've been taught to hate their country. This is very insightful. And some of you have heard me say this. I've put it on social media. I've put it on Twitter. I, you know, I really don't want to call it X. X just doesn't appeal. It just doesn't roll off the tongue. Twitter, Twitter works. Twitter is a much better name. But I, I've put this quotation. I wrote it down at the time that he said it. My son, Zachary, who is a Gen Zer, he said this of his own generation. My generation is loving this, meaning the, uh, the chaos that we've been witnessing for the last several years. 
My generation is loving this because they want their lives to be like a movie. They don't care what the plot line is. They just want constant drama. It'll be too late when they discover that it's at the cost of everything they love. Wow, when he said that, I thought that is spot on. And for generation, you know, instead of calling them Gen Zers, maybe a better name is Generation Selfie. For a generation that has been taught to be obsessed with self, to be obsessed with media, to be obsessed with um, the superficial rather than the substantive, this sounds exactly right. My generation is loving this because they want their lives to be like a movie. They don't care what the plot line is. They just want constant drama. I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, one of my English professors, she spoke of, one day she was, she was just kind of irritated because there were, I guess, a, I, I don't know what had happened, but maybe a number of students who said they couldn't take the quiz or couldn't take the test or weren't ready or something. And she said, there are drama people. There are drama people. There are people who just have constant drama. And when they don't have drama, they have to create it. And that, that reminds me of um, something a friend of mine who is, you know, is practically a PGA golfer. Um, um, he's, just a, uh, he's just a tremendous golfer. His name is Mark Miller. Mark, if you're, if you're watching, here's, here's to you. And I don't know if he's still a scratch golfer. And I have to say this, I'm not a golfer, so I'm really not that knowledgeable of golf. But I have been out with him a couple of times and I've watched him. And I've also seen other guys who are, you know, 15, 20 over par. And here's a guy who's, you know, is golfing almost right at par. And I remember asking him on one occasion, you know, did you ever think about going pro? Did you ever think about going pro? And he said this, and I've never forgotten this because it's, it's, it's insightful as it applies to other things. He said, you know, whenever I would be out on the course and say um, golfing significantly below par, and I become aware of that, he said, you know, I would, I would begin to tense up and I'd begin to slice one here and there and I wouldn't golf as well. And he said, you know, golfers, every golfer has a, you know, has a comfort zone. He has a comfort zone where he's, he's mentally comfort, comfortable with how he's golfing. And he said, for me, it's, you know, it's at par, maybe slightly above par. But if I get much below that, then I start, you know, mentally, I, I, I begin to tense up. Now, that is interesting to me because, you know, you think of a guy like, you know, let's say Tiger Woods when Tiger Woods was, was you know, was really great. Tiger Woods probably had a comfort zone that was well below par. I mean, that was where he was happiest. That was where he did his best golfing. And when he was above it is probably when he tensed up, not when he was below it. But I've thought about that as it applies to an entire generation, that there are those people that they have a comfort zone when it comes to drama because they have been kept by their government, by their media in a constant state of hysteria, in a constant state of fear. And the result is that when, when there's a period of tranquility, when there is a period of, of relative peace and calm, they're not comfortable there. And so they have to create drama. They have to create it because their comfort zone is in the drama zone. That's where they have to be. And that seems to me to describe much of what we're seeing with Gen Z. And again, I want to be clear. I am not saying that this is true of all Gen Zers. What I am trying to say to you is it's hard to imagine that the greatest generation, had they had access to videos, like this would have been making ones that said, gosh, I just read Mein Kampf. It just changed my whole worldview. I just read Mein Kampf. Yeah, please go read Mein Kampf. It, is, it has caused me an existential crisis. Please go read it and come back here and tell me what you think. It's In 20 minutes, it's changed my worldview and I just have to have someone to talk about it with. Because that's what this is. This is... It's not a big book like Mein Kampf, but it's a 
contains the same kind of ideas. It's anti-Semitic, it's anti-free, it's anti-American. It is a hateful, hateful letter. And just like Mein Kampf, both Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden had massive blind spots about their own wicked deeds. They could rail against the world and try to hold the world to a certain kind of moral standard that they themselves did not adhere to and did not think it applied to them. Osama bin Laden can, can carry on about planes flying into the sides of buildings and, uh, excuse me, he didn't carry on about that. He can carry on about the United States uh, uh, killing innocents, but ignores the fact that he just ordered planes into the sides of buildings killing 3,000 innocent people. He makes no mention of that. He couldn't care less. Those rules don't apply to him. But for Gen Zers, <clears throat> who I think it's almost as if they went through this letter and that there were certain passages that for them were highlighted that they read and they missed the larger context of the letter, which is Islam. Which is Islam. You think Gen Zers are, by and large, really interested in what real Islam is? Some of them convert to Islam. You know, was it Sinead O'Connor who, who converted to Islam? I think it was. Um, who, um, yeah, and, and I think she just recently died, you know, in the last couple of years. She converted um, to Islam. It wasn't this Islam. It was a kind of watered down, um, amputated from the Quran and the Hadith, a life of Muhammad kind of Islam that feels very multicultural and liberating and, um, you know, demonstrates what a broad-minded Westerner I really am by embracing it. They might be interested in converting to something like that, but, but not, the, not the real stuff, not the stuff that you see in the Middle East, not the stuff that you see in the no-go zones in Europe, and not the Islam that you see spreading throughout Africa. They don't care what the plot line of their movie is. They just want constant drama. Now, again, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but I do encourage you to do so. In a story about this in, uh, I think it was in The Guardian, the Guardian initially printed the whole letter, but they then went and took it down. You can go and type Osama bin Laden letter and Guardian in, and you'll pull it up, and you'll see that they now have a note that says, we initially had the letter here, but we have since taken it down. You can find it somewhere else. But they did because there were complaints that the letter was being published by The Guardian. After complaints, TikTok claims they began suppressing the hashtag. They removed the hashtag letter to America and they began suppressing the letter, which you know they had facilitated spread in, in, in the first place. Uh, they became their spokesman became quite defensive and said, hey, look, you know, this is really a, a big nothing. 14 million views is really nothing on this platform. Um, there are many other things that get uh, uh, more views, and this just really isn't a big deal. But I want to say this: I am against censorship of this letter. I am strongly against censorship of this letter, the same way that I'm against the censorship of Mein Kampf. You know, there have been lefties who, you know, upon seeing my um, library, will see William Shire, William Shire, his, uh, his big volume, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And the old volume of that, you know, that, that was published, I think, I think it was first published in the 19... 60s, maybe 1970s. I, I can't remember um, the date of publication of, of that book. It's excellent. It is superb. And by the way, the audible version of it, read by Grover Gardner, is awesome. I think I've listened to it probably three times. Uh, his reading of it is, I, I just want to listen to books that are read by Grover Gardner. His reading of classics is, uh, is fantastic. But somebody come into my library and they see the old dust jacket on William Shire's book that has a big swastika on it. And then they'll gasp and go like, oh, what are you, a fascist? No, that's a book about World War II. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the swastika was actually a symbol of the Nazis in World War II. And hence the reason it's on that book's jacket because that's what the book is about. I've tried to educate myself on this. Mein Kampf. I own a copy of Mein Kampf. I remember, I think it's even somewhere in the, uh, the intro to this show. 
that someone had criticized, I don't know if it was true or not, but somebody claimed that, um, I think it was, I think it was um, Trump's first wife during their divorce, she had claimed that he had a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. Not as a model. He's reading it. You should read that stuff. You should know what the opposition is saying. You should know what it is they believe. Um, again, in the introduction um, to this show, which I, it's, it's interesting because um, the good folks at Tome who produce this show, I didn't know that that was, I didn't even know I was being recorded when they put that together. That was, that was Josh's um, clever work right there. We were just sitting in the studio having a conversation and asking a little bit about my methodology. And I'd said, look, you know, I don't read what other people say about the bad guys. I go and read the bad guys. I, I don't want to read what someone else has to say about Klaus Schwab. I want to go read Klaus Schwab. I don't want to, want to read what someone has told me the World Economic Forum believes. I'm going to go and read what the World Economic Forum, what literature they're producing. I want to know what they're saying. I don't need it filtered for me. That's, that's part of my job for you is uh, I, I try to filter it for you. I try to do the, the you know, remember the scrubbing bubbles? Are you old enough to remember the scrubbing bu bubbles? Yeah, um, it was a spray for, you know, cleaning your tub. You know, what I thought would have been a good slogan for this show, a good slogan for this show. Do you remember what the scrubbing bubbles slogan was? It would show them scrubbing, you know, the tub and it'd say, we work hard so you don't have to. We work hard. And then they would say, you know, as they kind of go around the drain, they would say, we work hard so you don't have to. You know, so they go around. I, I think a good slogan for this show, we'll get the posse to vote on this, would be, I think hard so you don't have to. I think hard so you don't have to. I, I do this for a living. If I, if I did something else for a living, I would need someone like me to do that work for me. I don't, wouldn't have the time if I'm, you know, if I'm, you know, a in sales or I have, you know, some, some, I mean, I have the time to do this because it's my job to do this. But if I had some other, you know, I was in some other line of work, I would need somebody else to go and read these things. I would want them to read these things, to process these things, to make sense of them, and then to tell me about them. And that's what we try to do here on this show. We try to think hard. <laughs> we try to think hard so you don't have to. I'm not saying that I'm not encouraging thinking. Please think. Please think very hard. But I'm trying to make it less laborious for you by doing some of this for you. And by censoring this stuff, I think students need to be reading this. Now that assumes, when I say that, I come from an extensive teaching background and I would try to get my students into, there's a terrific little book that I used both in university and um, in preparatory school teaching uh, called Aspects of Western Civilization. And it's, um, it's just primary source documents. And there's another one when I taught history of Britain, history of England, that's called Eyewitness Britain. Both of those books are I think maybe it's even called the mammoth book of eyewitness Britain. I can't remember, but it's just primary source documents. Get young people into you read the primary sources, read Osama bin Laden's letter. Now it's dangerous if the people who are teaching it don't understand what it is that they're teaching, then it becomes a problem. Um, and when I say teach it or schools should be teaching it, I am, of course, assuming that it's being taught by educated, thoughtful, sensible people who aren't teaching it as a, uh, you know, as a model for life. But I think having students read things like Orwell and, uh, and having them read you know, Huxley and having them engage with these kinds of primary sources are important, and then you sit down with them and you discuss it with them. And we're, by the way, we're eventually going to have, as a part of this show, bear in mind that this show is still in the um, ground floor phase. We're still building this platform. We're still building this show and what will it, it will eventually be. But there will be a, um, a, a book group 
where there will be a smaller um, element of the posse that you sign up for this and then I give you a signed reading and, and something like this, you know, Osama bin Laden's letter, and then we engage in private discussion regarding it. And I kind of serve as your um, Virgil. Virgil, you know, is, the, is Dante's guide through hell <laughs> yeah. in the Divine Comedy. I would be your Virgil. I'm guiding you through hell. I, I would be your guide uh, to understanding these kinds of things. But students need to be engaging them. I want them to engage them. And then I want to ask them questions. So what is it that you found interesting about this? What, what rep, you like that. Why did you like that? Let's discuss that. Do you, do you think that's a good thing to like? Though, that, that's the way good teaching is done. And you, you, give them, you give them a moral lens, a historical lens, a, a lens of truth towards understanding the world. That's very, very important. So no, I'm opposed to, to censorship of this. The left wants to censor everything. Because they think that they should be the, what was it that Jacinda, in her name, Jacinda Arden, the, um, the former prime minister of New Zealand, she says that we are your sole source of truth <laughs> during the pandemic. She said this in a press conference. I mean, what startling, mind-blowing arrogance. We are your sole source of truth. Well, I am a Protestant, and I do believe the sole source of truth theory. And the sole source of truth theory is God's Word. You know, I do believe that's our anchor. I believe that's our foundation. I believe that is the source of absolute truth. But it doesn't speak for itself. Um, it does require some judicious handling. I mean, what does Scripture tell us? What did Tim Timothy say? Um, show yourself approved as good workmen rightly dividing, rightly handling, you know, the word of truth. Well, that applies to other things as well. Osama bin Laden's letter requires some judicious handling. It requires some understanding. And because these students don't have it, they don't have the educational background, they don't have proper values or proper understanding, they don't have the ability to properly understand it. So it, 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 is, it is just something that, that absolutely, um, you know, possesses them in a very very negative way. We have a new sponsor to the Ideas Have Consequences podcast, and that is John Candor, C-A-N-D-O-R, johncandor.com. John is a faithful member of the Posse, a faithful listener to this podcast, and he sent me some of his products. Take a look at these beautiful shoes, which I've been wearing. This other pair of beautiful shoes, all leather, um, which I have been wearing in this beautiful wallet, which I just received yesterday. And so I don't yet have my credit cards and such in it, but I American flag on it. It's lovely. Listen, some of you have been faithful supporters of Mike Lindell and my pillow, as you should be, because we want to support conservative businesses. Maybe you're tired of pillows and sheets and slippers. Well, Christmas is coming, and these kind of leather goods are just fantastic. I personally love leather goods. I really do. And this stuff is fantastic. Take a look at this travel bag, which is, uh, which is really beautiful. It is handcrafted, and you will find it all on johncandor.com. Support John. Support his work. Christmas is coming. Members of your family are going to love this stuff. I know it. So johncandor.com. So how did we get here? How did we get to a place where you have some Gen Z or some millennials producing videos like this? And by the way, there are even some on TikTok that are celebrating 9-11 like, yes, America deserved it. America deserved it. Those 3,000 people, they deserve to die. Yay, Osama bin Laden. Well, I think you're given a clue in what the first woman said. Quote, this has left me disillusioned, and I feel the same exact way as I felt when I was deconstructing Christianity. Did you pick up on that? Did you hear that in there? when I was deconstructing Christianity. There's a link between what these TikTok 
um, Gen Zers are doing and the decline of Christianity in the West, and specifically in the hearts and minds of these Gen Zers. Her disillusionment began with the deconstruction of whatever faith in God she had, leaving her without intellectual or spiritual immunity to the evil ideas that would pollute her mind and destroy her soul. She annihilated them because, as she said, she doesn't give us she doesn't give us a lot more details than that. But she says she deconstructed Christianity. She deconstructed her faith. So once she did that, she was sawing off the limb on which she was sitting. She no longer had an as we say on this show, an ideological, these are idiots, ideological foundation upon which to sit. Faith in Jesus Christ, real faith, a faith with intellectual and spiritual teeth inoculates you against all sorts of things. And this is one of them. Bad ideas are one of the things that you are um, inoculated against. I, I was fascinated. Years ago, I read his, uh, uh, um, I think he's a Cambridge historian, Orlando Figes. I read his excellent um, history of the Russian Revolution that's called A People's Tragedy. And one of the things he says in that book that I've never forgotten is this. He says that the triumph of Marxism in 1917 Russia can in no small measure be attributed to the fact that there were no viable competing ideologies in Russia at that time. He said it didn't conquer in the West of the 19th century or even in the 20th century. And he said the reason is because there was a, a, a viable Christian faith that served to critique Marxism and critique it harshly, and hence in the minds of Westerners, particularly in Americans and people in Britain, Marxism just had very little appeal to them because they had, had been able to see a proper critique. But the censorship laws in Russia were so severe, were so severe, says Figes, that almost nothing from the West got through, got past them. And when Marx's capital came along, you know, great big volume, big enough to fill a pothole, and it was a lot of factory analyses and data, they just thought, nobody's going to read this, and they let it through. And the result was it, became, it achieved almost instantaneous cult status among Russian intellectuals. They thought they were reading something that was deeply profound. And Fi just says because there were no viable competing ideologies, there was nothing, nothing really to compete with Marxism. And the result was it conquered the academic classes. It conquered the intellectual class. It conquered Russia itself and led to the, to the annihilation of millions, tens of millions of people. Do you see where censorship leads? The problem with that, but that, that fascinated me by Figes. Its conquest is because there were no viable competing ideologies. That is, that is absolutely fascinating. And so it is here in the minds of these Gen Zers. Ideologically vacuous, they will believe anything. What's happening in the minds of the young people in these videos is that there's, there's no viable competing ideologies to critique what Osama bin Laden is saying in his letter. This is also why, say, something like Mein Kampf would so easily triumph in the minds of a generation that wasn't properly nurtured um, and equipped, their hearts and minds fortified against things like this. What is it that G.K. Chesterton said, or is, I don't know if he actually said it or if it's just been attributed to him. I'm sure he, he said many things that were like this. When a man chooses not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. So when a man no longer believes in God, it isn't that he doesn't believe in anything. Uh, excuse me, it isn't that he believes in nothing. It's that he will believe in anything. And that is so very true. 
and believe in anything. And that's the case with these Gen Zers. A generation later, C.S. Lewis wrote this in his profound little book, The Abolition of Man, which is a superb little book that is actually, <laughs> is actually about the teaching of English. There was sort of a debate going on in um, 1940s Britain about how to avoid the rise of future Hitlers. How do you avoid the rise of Hitlers? And so there were those educators who said, well, we have to identify the potential Hitlers within our classes, and we have to um, annihilate the bad ideas that are, um, that are in their heads. And C.S. Lewis said, nope, nope, this is the wrong approach. Now listen carefully to what he says. My own experience as a teacher tells an opposite tale. For every pupil who needs to be guarded from a weak excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. The task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right defense against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For a famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head. Now, that's brilliant. Let me, let me break that down for you just a bit. Lewis is saying, don't try to find who the Hitlers are, you know, who, who the potential you know, megalomaniacs are in your classes. Instead, because those are people you're not going to reach anyway. They're, they're, you're not going to change their minds. They are who they are. They're, they're um, you know, kind of fixed. Or maybe I should put it the other way. They're, they're broken. You're not going to reach them. Instead, deny them their audience. The problem wasn't Adolf Hitler per se. It was the millions of people who willingly followed him. Listen to what he says here. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For a famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head. In this case, the propagandist is Osama bin Laden. He's come along with his letter, you know, post-mortem. And his letter is now affecting a generation of soft heads. They have soft heads. They have not been inculcated with just sentiments. And thus, says Lewis, they're easy prey to the propagandist when he comes spreading false sentiments. If their hearts and minds had been fortified, then Adolf Hitler is just a crank, you know, speaking at um, Speaker's Corner, spouting strange ideas that people go by and think he's an oddity and slightly amusing. But he's not an individual with power. He's not an individual who can control an entire country. How does it happen? It happens because you have generations of young people who are not properly inoculated against bad ideas. And that famished nature, says Lewis, is avenged. And it is avenged by them seizing upon bad ideas and believing them. It's interesting because when I um, was living in Europe, a little town where I was, um, a young man, a blue-eyed, blonde-headed French kid, I wrote an article about this, for USA Today, he did not come from a Muslim family. He just came from a traditional, you know, French family of, um, shall we say, uh, vaguely um, Catholic, you might say. But he was without purpose. And this young man, what does he do? And, and men want mission. People want mission, but young men in particular, they want challenges. That's why, you know, the army found it so successful with that advertising campaign in the, you know, the 1980s. We do more before 9 a.m. than most people do all day. You know, the idea being we jump out of airplanes, we rappel out of helicopters, we, we go and kick down the doors of bad guys. We are the United States Army. You want mission, come and join us. The Marine Corps, very similar kind of um, imagery that is, that is used. Well, Al-Qaeda uses um, 
uh, Islamic radicals, they all use similar kind of imagery. Great Satan, help us fight the great Satan. Help us, um, you know, free the oppressed peoples of the world. And here you have this kid by the name of Simon Lebrun. Simon Lebrun, again, blue-eyed, blonde, French kid, no Muslim background whatsoever, but he started going to the um, mosque in his town and he was soon radicalized. He joins the mosque in Toulouse. And then the next thing you know, the people in his hometown are seeing him. He has traveled to the Middle East. He's on television burning his French passport and he's joined ISIS. He's joined ISIS. How did it happen? Because he had a soft head. He had a soft head and he was looking for mission. He wanted mission and he didn't have it. Ideas, as we say on this show, ladies and gentlemen, have consequences and bad ideas have consequences. Did you happen to see this past week that uh, Ian Hersey Alley, do you, know, do you know who I'm talking about? Ian Hersey Alley, she's a very interesting woman. She's, she's married to, um, to Neil Ferguson, who was, I don't know where he is uh, anymore. Um, he's an Oxford educated uh, uh, Harvard historian who is now at Stanford University. And uh, he wrote a book called Civilization, the West and the Rest, which is a very compelling read. It was a bestseller, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. It's, um, it's, it's very interesting. I think he was an atheist. And I don't know where he is now, but he was married to Ian Hersey Alley. And Ian Hersey Alley was a, um, or, or is rather, I shouldn't say was, she's, she's still very much alive, thank God. Uh, she'd grown up in a, um, an Islamic country in Africa, and I can't remember um, which country she's from, and she suffered tremendous oppression under Islam. She managed to escape. She was in Europe. Um, she became an atheist. She declared herself an atheist, and she's been a, a much celebrated atheist uh, among guys like Richard Dawkins and you know the late Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and all of these people. She was she was um, weaponized by the so-called new atheists against Islam because this was a woman who was speaking out very truthfully about the horrors of Islam, the oppression of Islam, the treatment of women in Islam. Well, this past week or last couple of weeks. She came out with an article. She's now a fellow at the, uh, the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. And she came out with a fascinating article on unheard in which she says, why I'm now a Christian. You have to read this. You, you have to go and read this, people. And, and she, she is, she's using the title Bertrand Russell, the famed atheist of a century ago. Bertrand Russell famously, you know, wrote something called why I am not a Christian. And now here she is saying why I am a Christian. And why is she a Christian? She says, because something I have been screaming from the rooftops and have written in my books for the last 20 years. And she has come to the conclusion that secularism, that is atheism, is no defense against the march of Islam. It is no defense against the march of Islam. She says this, atheism can't equip us for civilizational war. And we are in civilizational war. It can't. And I don't know if she's seen this, but if she watched these videos of these Gen Zers, she would say, this is exactly what I'm talking about. They, are, they have been taught a secular worldview, which there's nothing compelling in that. And that just gets annihilated by Islam because Islam gives a sense of mission. There is a God. There's a sense of purpose. There's, there's a sense of divine purpose. What does secularism say? It says you are an accident in time and space, a chemical accident in time and space. Your life has no meaning other than that which you give to it. It's atheism. There's nothing compelling about atheism. I've actually had interesting conversations with the new atheists about this very thing privately, who will admit to you that what I'm telling you is true. They don't want to say it publicly, but they will admit that this is absolutely true. And I and Hersey Alley came to the conclusion, atheism offered me nothing. That's why I became a Christian. A generation, ladies and gentlemen, without defenses against false sentiments are easy prey for the propagandist 
when he comes. And when you're without ideas, you're without principles. And when you're without principles, you're anchored in nothing but your feelings, which is no anchor at all. It's what I have called on a previous show, Christian-ish. Christian-ish. Instead of eternal principles, your life is guided by vague inner promptings and a wishy-washy sentimentality. Sayings like, follow your heart, are regarded as sage advice in such a world. And the Bible, by contrast, which is rooted in eternal principles, is rooted in a fixed point, and that's a capital F and a capital P, as Aquinas would say, which is the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible would say, whatever you do, <laughs> don't follow your heart. Whatever you do, don't follow your heart. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It will lie to you. But it also leaves you without a theology of evil. Secularism has no theology of evil. And thus it assumes that evil is just a result of some people who are somehow just born bad. Secularism more or less maintains that we're born tabula rasa. This was a, an assertion of Richard Dawkins when I was in his home and conversing with him on this very thing. Do you think man is born good or evil? Evil. And he said, I, I reject the question because I only believe in genetic predispositions. Genetic predispositions. And so that leads to a conclusion that you're sort of a blank slate and you just simply take on the views of your culture or, you know, the, the, there's, there's your nature, your genetic predisposition, and then there's your nurture, the way you're raised. The Bible would say, no, that's not true. You are born speaking lies, said the psalmist. We are broken morally. We are broken morally. And hence, we must be inculcated with, as C.S. Lewis says, that is taught if you prefer that word to inculcation, which can sound a little uppity. You must be taught proper sentiments. You must be taught truth. Evil, for evil to exist, you must have a theology. And to have a theology, you must have a belief in God. And that requires sound teaching and sound preaching. This is a generation that is, according to the data, nuns. You've seen that term, nuns. Nuns means that they're, that's, and that's not in, nuns as in like Catholic nuns, N-U-N-S. <laughs> that's N-O-N-E-S, nun. They, when clicking, uh, checking boxes, you know, what are you, Christian, Muslim, whatever, they click none, none of the above. I'm not any of this. And so they don't identify, by and large, they don't identify as anything, religiously speaking. So they're very naive about the world because they have no theology of evil. And that, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely important. Now, there's a lot more that I could say on this topic, but I just want to end with this. I want to, want to leave you with this thought. When you see Gen Zers celebrating figures like, we'll put it up on the screen, figures like um, Che Guevara, the murderous Marxist revolutionary. I was in Cuba. Was it last year I was in Cuba? I can't remember now. But you saw Che Guevara's picture all over the place. And we'll put on the screen here a, um, a picture that I snapped in not just in Cuba, but in Dominican Republic at a cigar shop. And there's a picture of Che Guevara, you know, lighting up as though he's, he's somebody who's worthy of emulation. Che Guevara, ladies and gentlemen, was a murderous thug. He was a thug. And yet you will see a lot of young people who will have his image on their T-shirts. I bought for my boys... Um, a t-shirt that says Che Guevara's picture, and it says douchebag. <laughs> That's what it says, douchebag. And, um, and I thought, you know, hey, you can jar your own generation by wearing this. Well, this will lead to some interesting conversation. My boys are all prepared to have those kinds of conversations. But you can go online and you can find these, these, um, these t-shirts, and uh, I encourage you to own one. This Make a good Christmas present. I gave it to my boys at, uh, at Christmas. We'll put that up on the screen as well. But Che Guevara, 
being celebrated as a hero. Why is he being celebrated as a hero? Because, and I want to emphasize this, when I'm complaining about elements of Gen Z or millennials, really what I'm complaining about is those generations that have failed them. You have been failed. You have been failed often, not always, by your parents, often, not always, by your teachers, and often, not always, by your governments that have promoted these false views of history. I was flying back from, I don't know, Argentina, I think. And I'm looking, you know, scrolling through. Now they have the, uh, you know, the screens in the back of the seat in front of you. And I'm scrolling through all the movie options. And I see the Motorcycle Diaries. The Modal Motorcycle Diaries. This is a, um, I decided to watch it knowing full well what it is. The Motorcycle Diaries, uh, we'll, we'll put that image on the screen for you as well. The Motorcycle Diaries is a glamorized account of Che Guevara's youth where he and a friend got on a motorcycle and rode all over South America. And it shows them you know, falling in love and getting drunk and doing all the things that young people supposedly do, but also saving lepers. Because this is the kind of guy that Che Guevara was. He cared about the poor. And it's, it's, it's showing how Che Guevara supposedly, I don't believe this for a second, he continually meets people who are oppressed by capitalists. And it moves him towards mission. I'll be someone who will change the world. And in fact, the poster says this, let the world change you and you can change the world. This, this is what I mean when I say that millennials and Gen Zers have been failed by their elders because it's not Gen Zers who produced this movie. This is being produced by people who are feeding, spoon feeding this crap to a lot of young people who watch this and go, oh, I want to be like Che Guevara. So don't be shocked, ladies and gentlemen, if before long you start seeing Osama bin Laden t-shirts. You start seeing posters of Osama bin Laden. You start seeing some equivalent to the motorcycle diaries, what would that be? The, the, the camel diaries? I, I don't know. But something promoting Osama bin Laden as a man ahead of his time, as an environmentalist, as a champion of the people, as a socialist, as a Marxist. This is not who Osama bin Laden was. Teach your children well, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.